I've never quite played a game like Atomic Heart. It's crafted with so much love and creativity and almost childlike enthusiasm, but with that comes a child's level of impulse control, where some truly obnoxious excess threatens to ruin the game's strong foundation. So because nearly every moment feels as ripe for reward as it does for disappointment, I'm amazed it ever crossed the finish line, and that I managed to get through it too. But because of Atomic Heart's promise, I found myself rooting for it all the way to the end, in spite of its missteps. But is there too much in the way of the good stuff for the average person to endure? Well, let's get stuck in like a polymer upgrade and see whether first-time developer Munfish fills the heart with joy, or whether it just leaves us with a broken heart, after all. And that's where men like you come in, Sergei. Now I'll admit, I had really big expectations for Atomic Heart because of its frankly fantastic pre-release trailers that made it look like Bioshock on steroids. Shocking dudes, icing them, throwing them around with telekinesis and then blowing them up with some great looking guns? Ha! Forget about it, I'm there! But we've been let down so many times in the past by too good to be true marketing. But Atomic Heart wasn't lying. It looks and plays just like the trailers. That wide FOV and depth of field that makes even indoor areas feel freakishly immersive. That versatility between using guns and powers and all the particle effects in battle, all of it's here, at least theoretically. The game also runs surprisingly well for most people on most platforms, so despite it having its fair share of janky design and balance decisions, it's often an incredibly gorgeous game from a fidelity and art direction perspective. I did experience two crashes in my 30-40 to 40 hours playing it, and sometimes doors wouldn't open even if I fulfilled the requirements to trigger them to do so. I also had one weird bug that went in my favor, where enemies had broken a machine that was filling up a canister I needed, and in the middle of trying to get it working again I died. Upon reloading my save, the game didn't wait for me to fix the machine at all and just auto-filled the canister and completed the mission for me, which was welcome, but kind of wild. That sounds a little too easy. Generally speaking though, the game does look and run really well. Nowhere is this more evident than its fantastic, if a little long-winded, intro. It recalls Bioshock Infinite's opening with its sunbathed city populated by the bustle of festival goers and people hawking their inventions on the sidewalk but I think Atomic Heart's intro is even better than that one, because the people act a lot more realistically and have something interesting to say, building a believable and an intriguing world right off the bat. Infinite to me felt a little too safe, a little too museum-like, and a little too derivative of its earlier iterations without very much world justification. And I think that's what I like about Atomic Heart at its core. As much of a new kid on the block as developer Munfish is, they seem to be laying down the gauntlet and all their inspirations and going, okay, that was cool, now watch this. So, in this intro, we learn that this is Collective Day, the crowning achievement of gifted scientist and roboticist Dr. Dmitry Sechenov. In 1936, Sechenov discovered a plastic storage material called polymer, which can conduct electrothermal impulses and store information, much like Adam does in Bioshock. Years later, the USSR intervenes in World War II, where in this timeline, they are largely responsible for beating back Hitler and ending the war quickly but not before the Brown Plague is released, which kills millions across the world and decimates the population. Sechenov's polymer advancements allow the creation of a cold fusion reactor, which they use to create tons of robots to replace the workforce across the globe and gain the USSR a wide foothold, politically speaking. Soon, Sechenov found a way to make the polymer substance compatible with human physiology and allow human control of the robots under the collective system. Now, in 1955, on Collective Day, we take control of Major Sergei Necheyov, or his codename P3, who views Sechenov as his mentor and friend. P3 is proud to be a part of his mentor's newest innovation. Reporting for duty on Comrade Sechenov's direct order. Welcome, Comrade Major. Today is a joyful occasion, the birthday of Collective. A new collective model that will allow all USSR citizens to essentially download any knowledge or competency almost instantly from the neural network, just like how Neo learns Kung Fu in the Matrix. I know Kung Fu. The future is now, baby! Show me. But this isn't just sci-fi mumbo jumbo. This is an application of the USSR's communistic philosophy, that everyone's equal because everyone will have equal opportunity to knowledge as they're hooked up to this almost limitless well of it. This will keep the USSR as the proudest and most competent people in the world, as they see themselves already, and thank God it's because of communism, an all-for-one and one-for-all philosophy if there ever was one, right? But of course, in this world of perfect equality, some will be more equal than others, as your talking AI glove Charles is keen to remind you. In other words, Comrade Molotov wants to put Dr. Sechenov in jail over what happened here so he can take over the facility himself? To be exact. 
He wants to lead Collective. But how can he? Everybody's going to be equal there. Some will be more equal than others. Despite Collective seeming like a technological and cultural milestone for Soviet exceptionalism, an unknown party still wants more of the pie for themselves and sabotages the celebration, using Collective's neural network to send the robots into a murderous, destructive frenzy that destroys property and claims hundreds if not thousands of lives, Sechenov sends P-3 into Facility 3826 to retrieve the traitor Viktor Petrov, whom they seem to have think has hacked the collective network and made this all happen. But P-3 soon finds the treachery and intrigue behind the catastrophe to be much more complicated and dangerous than he first thought and has been told, and his allegiances to Sechenov and the USSR are tested over and over again to their breaking point. Now, I'm sure you've heard about how bad Atomic Heart's writing can be, and you've not heard entirely wrong. I'm losing my fucking shit. That's my goddamn status. I failed my mission again. Victor's dead, and I've got his head in a damn jar, and Sechenov thinks that's all fine and fucking dandy, get it? No, comrade major. I've done a lot of shit in my day, okay, but I've never lugged a human head around as a trophy. Did you see that gigantic robot in the theater? There was a combat robot in the theater, Charles. But you know what really grinds my gears? No, comrade major. The rings. The motherfucking rings that asshole Petrov gave me. And you know why it grinds my gears? No, comrade major. Me neither. What? It's worth knowing that plenty of conversations and cutscenes are actually pretty good, some incredibly dramatic and exciting, and some touching and profound in their own ways. But in between, you'll have to listen to P3 essentially say, neener neener, to everyone he knows. He is one petulant motherfucker. What? Rescue the bitch whose fault it is I'm wading knee deep in gore? What the fuck? Charles, open it. Unfortunately, I lack the ability to unlock doors. You're like a broken record, you know that? And after like 10 to 15 hours, you want to smack the guy upside the head. Part of it is translating Russian phrases into English, but even the English voice act has a little trouble reading some lines like shit ass that'll just make you grimace. Now what'll probably drive you most crazy beyond P3's constant need to shit talk everyone is his whinging about how arbitrary the puzzle design is, which after about the fifth time, you've got to just look at Munfish Square in the eyes and go, really? There's also some silly stuff like the sex crazed Nora the talking item machine. I can do so much more. A quick romp with your axe is just a taste of things to come, you handsome beast. Did you enjoy it, big guy? Some people hate her, some people love her. I think she's good for a laugh or two, but the joke is decidedly one note and doesn't really go anywhere. I can't wait for your strong hands to pull my interface with the lustful abandon. That's it. We're done here. Let's go. So yeah, there's there's plenty of cringe here, but side characters like the maid robots deliver some great lines about how the USSR has a Dadaism expert. It was developed by our leading expert in the field of advanced interpretive avant-garde absurdist Dadaism. Or describing their loyalty to the Communist Party in charmingly ignorant terms. The writing is very self-aware that the culture is completely foolish and up its own ass. Sure, we get the kinds of weird Russian turns of phrases, the memes, the old cartoons in the save room, and other whimsical aspects of Russian culture that only locals are likely to get, and, you know, which anyone could find culturally charming. But if you're really paying attention, it all begins to feel like cotton candy stopping up the ears of the populace so that they'll buy into the greater and greater pipe dreams that the party spins up for them. P3 and others take plenty of shots at the oh-so-misguided capitalist and Americans and extol Russia's virtue in helping them see the light, but it's dramatically ironic because we know the outcome of this ideological and actual warfare, and the characters are stuck in time, still awaiting that fallout that's to happen in the future. It's interesting stuff, and proves that even if Munfish's political acumen is a bit childish or appropriating, they've at least got a good sense of the culture they're writing about and a reasonable dichotomy between humor, dramatic irony, and political commentary. I'd also like to point out some of the music and the Russian radio broadcasts that you hear from time to time as being pretty interesting and varied. The music is really catchy, like the chill beats of the save room track or this great metal tune in the lab section. There's also tons of Russian pop and other sure-to-be-copyright claim things you'll have to listen to for yourself. Just consider my immersion into a weird Russian facsimile confirmed with all this variety. Adding to this immersion is how Facility 3826 features an incredible diversity of Soviet iconography and original designs that feel like a place that could exist should these advances have been made in a place that's full of itself. 
and it's easy to be artistically impressed by, while still maintaining that you know it's an idol to a deadbeat philosophy. It's just breathtaking stuff, and the level design is just as grandiose as the opening sequence is. It goes from linear corridors to large, semi-open overworld stretches where you must dodge alarms and patrols, and sometimes even get to drive vehicles, all the while being tempted to stop and dive down into puzzle dungeons that reward you with upgrade parts for your weapons. There's no strict rhythm here, as it's all dictated by the story and, you know, kind of how far they let you veer away from it but there's a fairly good amount of variety in the types of places that you'll go and how you'll be asked to traverse them. Try imagining it as if you got to play through Bioshock levels like Arcadia, but this one's plants come alive to kill you and it's full of Wolfenstein the New Order robots, and then the next minute you've got to go down and do portal puzzles in one of Fallout's vaults, pausing ever so often to go topside for some very Far Cry feeling exploration. There's a lot of great level design here. When you're not topside, you're typically progressing through a research facility with tons of puzzles and minigames to get through, or sometimes you'll be treated to levels like the theater where you get to solve interesting puzzles where you have to move the robot ballerinas into a pose that matches the way in which the people nearby were killed. There's a lot of personality and bespoke detail here, and just like Bioshock or Prey, you get to hoover up all these little trinkets and resources lying around so you can craft health or energy syringes, ammo, or polymer to upgrade your abilities with. It's oddly addicting just holding out your glove and sucking up all the resources, pulling drawers open and sending papers flying as you magnetically drain the area of all of its goodies. Fun as this is, it's too bad then how often the pacing of exploration is weighed down by the focus on mini games and other stoppages. Now the mini games themselves aren't actually that bad. There's one where you've got to snap your fingers at the same time as a rotating light and repeat until all are lit, and this has to be done under a time limit. Another has you rotating colored orbs until they match the pattern. The third type has rotating sets of lasers that you must use to match the combination at the top of the puzzle. They're actually pretty decent fun. It's just like most things in Atomic Heart, Munfish sticks these on just about every door you see or in between every major puzzle, so they come up so much more often than is interesting and they feel like arbitrary obstacles padding out the levels more than refreshing changes of pace. This extends to the major side missions called Testing Grounds, which are these elaborate puzzle segments with three puzzles in each, and each of which grants you a single upgrade part for a weapon. Some of these are pretty great, and some just have bonkers logic or bonkers physics. There's these glowing balls that are often part of the puzzles as they power up certain things, and sometimes you've got some cool portal-like back and forth to do with them to progress, but there are so many times that the game is asking you to rely on the physics to throw them across long gaps or just above you, and you have to hope they lock into place or they'll fall down and have to be retrieved again. You'll also have to carry them through these long tubes with the magnetic use of your glove and have to hope the physics don't bug out and get stuck or make them disappear from the game entirely requiring a reload like happened to me once or twice. And don't get me started on the platforming. Sometimes you get some classic follow the yellow paint platforming and it feels pretty good, just like it should. And you're like, nice one, Munfish. And then one pops up that makes you wonder if God still loves you because it's so mind-bendingly frustrating or unresponsive and it's so loosely constructed that you just have to trial and error your way to get through it and hope for the best. There's also this version of the classic game Snake that you've got to solve. And no lie, it took me hours of failing before I almost gave up on the game entirely. Now, of course, my second playthrough, I got it in about two tries, but man, that first go was rough. Now, I hate to dogpile in so much of the content here because there is a great deal of it, and it's clear that a lot of time went into making a diverse amount of legitimately challenging puzzles. Munfish's dedication to making sure that the game respects the player's intelligence with challenge and variety is commendable, but if the puzzles work, they're often drawn out for too long or padded with too many of those little mini games and other things, and if they don't work, they feel like the game's just sort of breaking down on itself. I've never seen so much capable game design exactly next door to so much incident jank before, and that's just kind of Atomic's heart's DNA at this point, unfortunately. But this level of polish in spite of a lot of bad beats is exactly why I kept playing, though these things never stop being an issue. Alright, so that's generally how the indoor spaces work, so let's turn our attention to the overworld sections, specifically. There's so much attention here to even faraway areas where NPCs are milling around or machinery is whirring to life, but my god, do these absolutely blow to explore. For one thing, you're not really allowed much time to get your bearings or really given any mechanics to help you traverse it more easily. 
there are cameras all over the place here that are hard to spot and so you end up getting seen a lot, raising an alarm, and then getting absolutely swarmed with robots as a result. And even if you can kill a couple, they'll be quickly revived by healer bots that res them instantly. There's no realistic way to actually overcome an alarm response like you would in say GTA. You mess up once, you're basically done for. Which wouldn't be the end of the world if you actually had good counterplay, like any ability to be stealthy. The game early on tutorializes a grab from behind stealth kill system, but robots are almost never idle for very long and are extremely alert, seeing you from hundreds of feet away at times, so stealth is really just a non-option. Even on New Game Plus, with nearly fully upgraded guns, I really wasn't able to just bully past these guys much either. So you'd think, well, if you can't really sneak up on them and you can't engage them directly, you probably have to run away a lot, right? Yes, you do. But, uh... It's made a little bit awkward by the fact that you can't actually sprint. Now you have a dash move, which has to recharge after every use and only gets up to two uses if you manage to dig deep into the upgrade tree early and find out this is even there. So if you're trying to get past these indomitable patrols, all the while probably wanting to explore the puzzle dungeons for upgrades while you're at it, you're going to have to fight through a ton of game over screens to do so. And if you have the ability to catch a ride and make it easier on yourself, unfortunately the cars don't handle well either, being super slow to adjust, getting stuck on things a lot, and you can't even heal while inside them so you can easily get killed while trying to back up and go forward again. The same type of cluster fucking happens late in the campaign too when you're absolutely swarmed by the plant monsters, which can charge you and knock you down pretty easily and are constantly spawning these spores that animate any dead bodies lying around and make even more enemies to deal with. It's pretty chaotic and the save points down here are pretty far apart, so you can easily lose 15 to 20 minutes of difficult combat down here and have to do it all over again. The problem is really the combat style that Munfish chose, which recalls the best of Bioshock like it's pick the right category or mode, the balance of the particularities is just way off. Now OG Bioshock's combat is often pretty fairly maligned for being a little stiff and basic, but you generally had enough firepower to fight back and knew, you know, kind of when you were or weren't going to win a battle, and you could always just respawn and go again. Atomic Heart puts a lot of undue pressure on its admittedly fun selection of counterplay options, and so it ends up feeling a lot messier than even OG Bioshock in many ways. So you've got melee options, guns, and what are essentially your magic spells. I mean, plasmids. Uh, I mean, polymer abilities. Now let's talk melee first. I honestly found the hit detection too spotty and the melee abilities of enemies to outshine me far too easily to bother with melee much with one major exception. The dash doesn't help matters here too, as we've talked about, because it feels like someone just push kicking you away and not very far at that, so it's easy to still get clipped by the much more agile and dangerous animations that most enemies have. The only melee weapon that really tipped the scales in your favor and stole my atomic heart was the iconic double chainsaw blade weapon that we saw in the promo footage called the Zivez Doka, I'm told. This thing starts off merely okay at first, but once you pick up enough resources and find the rotating blades upgrade, you basically create a handheld helicopter that is the highest damaging weapon in the whole game, and it just makes mincemeat of even bosses on the Armageddon difficulty that you're locked into on New Game Plus, which is the hardest difficulty. On my first normal difficulty run, this weapon dominated the second half of the game too, the only limit being the energy used to power it, which is a resource that you can upgrade to have more of, can recharge it faster and all that, and which actually slowly recharges as you deal damage with the weapon's conventional attacks. This weapon is also a godsend against these crazy carnage looking bosses that basically only take damage from melee weapons. This weapon does break the game's balance in half, but you deserve it because the odds are so unfairly stacked against you otherwise. And that brings us to the guns. These are a really mixed bag. Almost every gun I liked at first turned out to be awful as the game wore on, and the enemies started to get arbitrarily tougher and have more abilities. The shotgun was an early favorite because, well, shotgun, but also because the knockback kept the mustachioed robots at bay, killed them in one shot or two, and generally just did good, honest work. But as the enemies became more numerous and durable, the shotgun became a liability. It fires too slowly, takes too long to reload, even when fully upgraded, and just doesn't deal enough damage or knockback, despite how good it looks tearing through the plant monsters. I love shotgun, but shotgun, no love me. The Kalash rifle, which is of course supposed to recall the classic Kalashnikov, is pretty much the best gun in the game bar none, as its efficacy never wavers and only gets better with upgrades. I took on the last boss no problem with it as long as I brought enough ammo with me. Never leave the save rooms without this one. The MP pistol starts off pretty laughable but becomes utterly lethal with a nice clip size and great accuracy. You can also easily make a lot of ammo for it. 
The Electro is a slow-firing, multi-purpose energy pistol that can be upgraded to have a really cool EMP blast and runs on the same energy that the chainsaw blade does. It's hyper-versatile and one of the real hidden treasures in the weapon roster, being able to be tuned against organics or robots, while still having baseline functionality against both, unlike most guns. Unfortunately, beyond these, all the weapons that should be power weapons are a fucking laughingstock. The Dominator is like a machine gun version of the Electro, and it feels great to shoot, but it uses up energy way too fast and doesn't deal nearly enough damage to be worth it. The Fatboy Rocket Launcher is slow overkill against anything but bosses, and I found only one whole boss that was even weak to it. All the other bosses and even some barely mid-tier enemy types I tried it on just shrugged it off like a bad rash. <laughs> Fuck this thing. The railgun sounds good, but it's incredibly slow and not as effective as I thought it'd be. So my loadout became the indispensable kalosh, the MP or the electro, and the overpowered chainsaw blade. There's just an incredible amount of variance in the other guns, and since you don't have any time to fuck around in this game, you've got to go with boring and practical versus cool looking but utterly disappointing. So yeah. Necessity made me appreciate a very small section of the roster, which is unfortunate because Atomic Heart puts really cool looking tools at your disposal, like the ice pick weapon or the snowball mace, but they're just not good enough in the long haul. The same goes for the game's versions of plasmids, the polymer abilities. You've got to be really careful which of these you spend your points on. I was assured that Atomic Heart's beginning polymer ability, which is called Shock, was worth keeping around as it scaled nicely in damage and stun capability as the game wore on. I always kept it with me as a kind of a last chance debuff, but it only had moments of brilliance where it would alight onto some polymer lying around for some extra damage as an enemy walked over it, or maybe it did some lethal damage to some robot that would work better than just some generic physical damage. But it was fairly inconsistent in its application and just doesn't do much against organics. It also just looks incredibly weak, like someone flicking a cigarette lighter, versus looking like the Emperor's chain lightning. I was also advised to invest in Polymer Jet, which shoots out marshmallow goo like the glue gun in Prey, and which conducts any element you shoot into it and hypercharges its damage output, meaning you can shock it or put ice on it and it'll amplify the effect. It's pretty cool in theory, but you're not even immune to the polymer jet's effect yourself, so it's kind of annoying to shock yourself if you're moving around on top of the goo you just put down by accident. This one's still pretty decent though, and has the most potential for abuse because pretty much all the other abilities interact with it. But I never felt like I was taking down hordes of guys with it or anything. The two polymer abilities I wish I hadn't overlooked in my first playthrough were Mass Telekinesis and Frostbite. Much like Shock acts just like the Lightning Plasma in Bioshock, so too do these abilities mimic their counterparts there. Mass Telekinesis lets you lift up three to four guys at once though, and while they're up there you can pelt them with gunfire or even activate your rotating chainsaw blade and make mincemeat out of them in midair. The Frostbite ability can just freeze guys in place to buy you room, but can also be upgraded to damage them while frozen, and it was a great help in one of the most frustrating sections of the game in the lab that I mentioned earlier, when you're overrun with spawning plant monsters, and you can just come around behind frozen guys and shoot their weak spots for a lethal hit, and really freeze you up. But these two abilities are really the only ones that felt game changing to me. There's something so strange about how often the abilities look cool, but don't really do any damage or synergize all that well with the other ones. Much like the melee weapons and the guns, so much of what you can do is largely so much less than the super agile robot enemies, who can leap all over the place, knock you down, and often hit you while you're getting up to kill you, or hit you with lasers from across the map, or any other number of obnoxious sequences. What I found was that the game really needed to make you aware of the two best polymer upgrade paths, your character and energy management ones. Character is essentially passives like faster sprinting or the double dash move, and energy management makes your powers use less energy or recharge energy better and faster. Again, I can't tell you how much the double dash ability needed to have a glowing sign upon it. It's incredibly valuable. It's also really deep in the skills tree and almost essential to beating the first boss who fires volleys that are just so hard to dodge when you only have one dodge available because you'll just get hit by the second volley that he does right after. Things that you're supposed to activate to damage him almost never pop up when you tell them to or just never come online so that you can in the first place. The boss's attack patterns also vary wildly in damage. Sometimes you can take three to four hits and other times you'll just be one-shotted. It was just a grand time, all told, and a real welcome to Atomic Heart moment, if I do say so myself. So yeah, I guess we're talking bosses here real quick. I'll try not to ruin too many specifically, but they can all hop around like gorillas off their Ritalin, some pound the ground and send out shockwaves of energy you've got to jump over. 
Some shoot missiles or lob explosive grenades, and some shoot long-range lasers at you. Most animate beautifully and are full of personality and cool design, but a good many either are pushovers or way too fast and too overpowered compared to who you are at that point in time that you encounter them. It's too bad that they end up being mostly okay with some sharp spikes and jank. And that's my general point-by-point -point impressions about Atomic Heart. I guess it's funny that I said there was a lot of things that kept me going, but I've been complaining quite a bit throughout, haven't I? And I'll be honest, I'm currently suffering through the New Game Plus and the Hardest Armageddon mode because the game locks you into it and won't even let you have fun abusing the lower difficulties with all of your unlocks. Yet again, Munfish constrains the fun zone unnecessarily. So I'm probably feeling a little bit vindictive right now as I get to the end of the game. But I did like the first 10 or so hours that I replayed recently, and I'm anticipating those final cutscenes again because they are pretty well done even if they borrow quite a few beats from Bioshock, as we'll find out pretty soon in spoiler territory. But the main reason why Atomic Heart was appealing to me and remains so in spite of its utter inconsistency is that it's a crafted campaign made by some folks with a lot of flair and a lot of personality. It cares about its story, even if its writing is a bit goofy at times. It certainly drives the action, and it's trying to juggle a lot of plates at once with three types of combat options, a lot of upgrades within those options, and tons of side content and world building to engage in should you have the interest or the patience. But of course, the same reason I bounce off a lot of modern games is the reason that Atomic Heart wears out its welcome at times. The idea that more game is better game pervades this experience too. So many puzzles are drawn out or just come one after the other after the other that it can make them feel less special and fulfilling instead of just giving you a wide variety of experiences that naturally relieve you from the last one and make each iteration feel refreshing. The mini games are overused, the combat has its moments, but it's rare that on any difficulty that there's much of a power fantasy going on here. The weapons are mostly just too weak or situational, and the enemies are just so much more agile and strong than you, and if you can get them knocked down, many times they can just get rezzed and crowd you to death. Some combat encounters require way too much cheesing, like this small room where you're sworn by bots and are criminally low on resources. But the skeleton, the framework for fun, is here, and you'll find yourself going for some good stretches where the game feels great, which makes it feel all the more like betrayal when you're vibing with the world and the combat and maybe you just heard a funny joke a robot told oh help me comrade major i'm falling then suddenly you're stuck in a long gauntlet of tedious puzzles or brutal combat encounters but this thing's still on game pass so the worst thing you can do is try it and not like it the world is so captivating and its lore is so fun as an alternate history fever dream that it's hard not to recommend that you at least try the story gets pretty metal too, and with that, I think it's time that we get into how that story actually pans out. Big spoiler warning here for Atomic Heart, and also the Bioshock games. Let's do the thing. Yeah, 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 been there, done that. Skip the foreplay, bot. So we've mentioned Bioshock a fair few times in this review, right? It makes sense, as the intro definitely feels like Bioshock Infinites, and your polymer abilities, of course, mimic a lot of Bioshock's plasmids. But that's not the only part of the 2007 classic that Munfish mines very intentionally. As the story goes on, it starts to resemble quite a few of that game's twists and turns, too. But let's start off with what is the most original, Atomic Heart's hook. So if you'll remember, Sechenov accuses low-level dude Viktor Petrov of hacking the collective network and making the robots go postal. But once you track down this annoying little git, he reveals to you that you've been played and that the truth is far more sinister. Writing code that would add such complicated functions for even one robot, much less thousands, would take way longer than Petrov's got. No. In fact, these robots already had the capabilities to kill, and Sechenov designed them this way from the very start. All Petrov did was aim the deadly weapons at the populace to show the world how dangerous these things were, and he informs P3 of the Atomic Heart Project, which is, the USSR hasn't just been giving out their robots to the whole world out of the kindness of their hearts, they're lying in wait to take over should Sechenov and company feel the need. P3 is incredulous, as he can't believe this to be true of his mentor, but even he's starting to get suspicious. He runs into a very Baba Yaga-like character named Granny Xena, too, who seems weirdly invested in the goings-on here and connected as well, despite being a free agent. And P3 suspects that she knows more than she's letting on, much like Sechenov. When you finally get to Petrov, for instance, he kills himself and you preserve his head in a container very Wolfenstein the New Order style, and you retrieve two beta rings, as they're called. You're not quite sure what they are, but when Sechenov, his associate Stockhausen, and even Granny Zeno all ask about these rings' whereabouts, P3 feels inclined to lie and say he didn't see them at all, suspicious by all the inquiries about them. 
And then the game really pivots into Bioshock mode, for better or worse. Your talking glove Charles asks if you would kindly be more specific about what P3's misgivings are. I just thought about what Petrov told me. Would you kindly be more specific? Petrov said combat mode was programmed into the bots during construction. You can also see what happens in some previous cutscenes where it's revealed that P3 has been blacking out, being sent to this Soviet candy land looking place called Lembo, which is basically a mental dimension where all the people hooked up to Collective go when the powers that be use the neural network to control your body. We find out that we assassinated Sechenov's opposition earlier, and the twin robots use the polymer-laden viscera to create this chilling new creature. Then we return to a similar area to deliver Petrov's head and find that the German associate of Sechenov, the aforementioned Stockhausen, is in on all of this. In comes Petrov's former lover Larissa, who has dumped him since he revealed that he was behind the day's robot attacks. She's made up her mind that she's got to stop all of this, so she blows up Stockhausen and Petrov's head and knocks P3 into a daze, and he enters the crazy world of Limbo yet again. But once you awake, Larissa apologizes and you decide to join up with her so she can tell you what's really going on here, hopefully giving you the perspective of someone who doesn't have an axe to grind. On your way to see her, we see an objective pop up called Everything Illuminated, and we see a lighthouse in the distance. Now this has to be a reference to the actually really good Everything is Illuminated book and or movie starring Elijah Wood about a Jewish American man reconnecting with his heritage in Ukraine, a premium reference if I ever saw one. The lighthouse, of course, is a Bioshock reference. There's always a man in a lighthouse, Infinite tells us. And in case this wasn't an obvious enough reference, we enter the lighthouse and then into a bathosphere-like elevator that lowers us beneath the ocean where big daddy-looking orbs can be seen outside, mournful, familiar strings play, and P3 even comments that this looks amazing, a rapture even. It looks amazing, a rapture. I wouldn't mind spending some time there myself. <laughs> Okay, Munfish, we got it the first 10 references. You like Bioshock as much as I do. I got it. You've got good taste. And once we're done with the Bioshock Nostalgia Museum, we meet Larissa and she reveals Collective is about mind control of the humans connected to it, not some utopian interconnectedness to promote education, empathy, or simply to control the robot workforce. P3 himself has been the subject of such mind control by Sechenov for some time now, just like Jack was a sleeper agent activated by Fontaine's would you kindly phrase, in Bioshock. The Rissa shows P3 the horrible mind control testing chambers where groups have gone mad or killed each other while being tested. The only group that survived has had their minds completely sent over to the limbo dimension while their bodies remain here listless and completely under control by collective. The Rissa shows P3 she's not lying, even making a wry comment that she'll make them all go through the motions together because we do live in a communist society after all. Why don't I make them all jump? After all, we all live in a communist society. She later says that all of this is robbing the people of their free wills. Yet again, Munfish is being pretty clear that this behavior is horrifying, dehumanizing, and unforgivable. P3 gaslights the hell out of her too, showing us that someone who is completely bought into the system will do anything to justify any atrocity in the name of the already assumed righteous cause. So. Anyone telling you this story is glorifying Russia or communism is out of their ever-loving minds. I'm sorry, but if you don't understand that, you're an idiot! This revelation paves the way for an even bigger revelation that your AI glove Charles is not merely an AI, but the uploaded consciousness of a rival scientist that Sechenov killed off. The late Charitan Zaharov in that role. Who's Zaharov? A tenured professor of medical science, an esteemed neurosurgeon, and one of the scientists who vanquished the Brown Plague, Chariton Radionovich Zaharov, was also Dr. Sechenov's closest friend and trusted colleague. They laid the foundation for Facility 3826 together. He's been reduced to polymer goo, just like the dead people we saw earlier, and he's not too stoked about it. The exact impact of this isn't revealed just yet, so let's jump to the next revelation about P3's past. P3 and his wife, Ekaterina, were agents on a mission for the USSR in Bulgaria that went pear-shaped. She died, and P3 almost did as well, his body having to be reconstructed with tons of prosthetic parts. This reconstructed process altered P3's personality so that he became much more aggressive, which is supposedly a justification why he's such an asshole to everyone now, but that doesn't really excuse how over-the-top and annoying he is. It's just not something that needed to be committed to this hard. 
Now all this backstory about his wife falls pretty flat to me because we're never given any ability to connect to her. So it's just like trauma dumping that we can't relate to because it was never hinted at or built towards emotionally. Weirdest of all, for some reason, his wife's ballerina and martial arts prowess were uploaded to the sexy twin robots. Oh, big ick, dude. And we find out that Granny Xena is actually a Katarina's mother and P3's mother-in-law out for vengeance. Dun dun dun. But the twists keep coming and they don't stop coming. If Sechenoff is Andrew Ryan, then we need a Fontaine. And it turns out that our beloved Charles, who is actually Zaharoff, is actually on a revenge plan to get back at his murderer Sechenoff. He's the one that's been controlling you and sending you to limbo, not Sechenoff. This was all part of his plan to frame Sechenoff for the murder of the politician Molotov from earlier and reclaim the power of Collective for himself. Zaharoff's polymer leaves P3's glove and interfaces with the polymer monster the twins created earlier, resembling Fontaine's final boss fight form from Bioshock. He also speaks in big abstractions like Fontaine did about the nature of good and evil and how he's you know, above it now that he's in this new form. And that he's above the sheep-like dependence of the common man on the state to care for him. And then we get a little post-mortem that some agencies scoured these labs shortly thereafter and found no traces of our characters. We cut to a shot of Limbo and we hear a Katarina's voice calling to us as one of the ballerina twins reaches out and then credits. The shit has hit the fan and Munfish is headed for the exits. This is all very dramatic and you know pretty fun to watch, but it does kind of feel like it ends right as it's just about to get interesting, which may just be a clever ploy on Munfish's part to keep us coming back. Sequel bait or just to hook us into playing those DLCs? Well, the first DLC doesn't even continue this ending, but the alternate ending where you simply refuse to go after Sechnoff and the game just ends. This first DLC, called Annihilation Instinct, focuses on Nora, that horny fridge as she's called from earlier, and deals with finding out who invented her and why she's so dead set on sexualizing everything. The new environments and weather effects here are pretty good looking, I'll admit, but the story didn't really need to continue on from what feels like an Easter egg ending that technically ignores all the big reveals. We get to meet Nora's inventor, Lebedev, who tells us that Granny Xena is after us now for not going after Sechenoff and avenging our wife and her daughter. Xena is also after Nora because she's an autonomous weapons manufacturing plant and can be of great use, which, okay, I didn't realize she was that important or that was that impressive, but you just have to kind of go with it in the DLC as it feels a little arbitrary. Most of the game is collecting MacGuffins to repair Nora, whom we find out is a corrupted AI designed to be completely loyal to one man who would be controlling her. Petrov tried to make himself the object of her desire, and when her logic algorithms found his whiny ass unsuitable to her loyalty, he basically broke her mind and turned her into the horny fridge she is today. So it's our job to get her back up and running. To age her quest, you get this new shovel spear thing that thrusts through guys pretty well. <laughs> that sounded naughty. I think that Nora chick is getting to me. You also get a new kind of laser tuning fork gun thing that would be at home in dead space. It's pretty cool stuff. Now I've heard complaints that the DLC is too hard, but I thought the encounters were much better designed than the main game because there aren't so many lunging enemies that knock you down or mess your aim up over and over again. I also like the boss fight here where this robot is made up of all these smaller robots and it keeps forming and reforming itself as the fight goes on. The voice acting here also feels a lot more refined, as does the pacing. I really think if Munfish doubled down on not trying to make every moment the most game it can be, they'd make their good ideas feel really special and worth replaying to to experience over and over again instead of you know wearing them out up front. This DLC's tight focus doesn't feel just like a natural budgetary choice for DLC, but the direction that the franchise should go from here, at least theoretically, as the bloat really needs to be cut down if Atomic Heart's further episodes are going to sing. Now I will say this, as far as the DLC's ending, I didn't get a whole lot out of it. It's like you end up affecting Nora in a positive way, but Rainy Zena is shown to be still in pursuit of you as you zoom away. I'm not really sure why we're prolonging this dud ending with more cliffhangers, but there you go. So that brings us to the second DLC called Trapped in Limbo, which continues on from the much more interesting ending. Unfortunately, I think it's actually the inferior DLC of the two released so far. This one takes place entirely in Limbo, or Soviet Candyland as I like to call it. This means that Munfish gets to go absolutely crazy with their Monty Python looking dream world, but it also means there's very little that's grounded about it. We pick up right where the main game left off, where the Ekaterina Ballerina comes to you and guides you through it. Unfortunately, you've turned back into a nearly mute little fluffy snowball creature like you did before when you entered Limbo. You spend a lot of your time fighting candy monsters and smashing little weird toys and candy shit. The new cartoon sound effects and visuals are artistically really creative and fun, but the gameplay is mostly just little candy 
and skirmishes punctuated by short sliding sections in between them, and they're all linear, right? The second hour of the DLC focuses a lot more on puzzles and platforming, so it's a much more interesting affair, but all this can't help but feel kind of perfunctory and time-killing rather than dramatically interesting and building towards much of anything. It also begs the question, what does this really have to do with the terrible state of affairs that the mad Charles left the USSR in in the ending? You'll hear his voiceovers from time to time as you frolic across this fairy tale land, and while his voice acting is as great as always, he's a specter here, and so you feel pretty disconnected from the conflict that I personally really wanted to see progressed. Ekaterina's also done dirty here too. In the main game, her tragic backstory comes in at the 11th hour, and you really haven't had any hint that P3's been lied to about it, so there's not really any emotional connection connection to it. And then when she shows up here, she sounds positively glib about everything, like some AI tour guide. The important thing is that you listen to me and everything will be okay. I'm a pro here. It feels very much like she's recording her lines completely independent of an acting partner, and it shows. She's just a little too cutesy for the situation, in my humblest of opinions. And don't even get me started on the ending sequences, one where you're pursued in third person by a goose that's some kind of Russian meme come to life, I hear, and which basically constitutes you hopping around and picking up power-ups like some weird LSD Mario Kart. Well, more LSD than Mario Kart already is. By the end, you see one of the ballerina twins in P3 had this touching moment where he declares he's going to get through this with his wife and for her to just hold on and, you know, stay the course. And then he says, and now the rings, implying the rings he told Granny Stockhausen and Sechen off about? I guess that's the next DLC. Kind of a random cliffhanger. But at least this kind of emotionality is much more meaningful here and kind of the mode that the series needs to go in instead of constantly being irreverent or melodramatic or obnoxious. And I'm intrigued here if only for a moment. Maybe we'll see something a little bit more powerful in the storyline as we go along. So yeah, man. while the quality of the game proper and the DLCs is a bit hit or miss, I still feel like there's way too much potential here with this franchise. Munfish is too creative and too clearly full of passion and talent to sleep on, and I find myself pushing through the jank over and over again to get to the good stuff. Now, that doesn't mean I take back any of my numerous criticisms, but that I understand that with great criticism comes great care, and I only care because I think they've got a good sense of what makes a narrative SPS-style game fun, even if the application of that understanding or the degree at which they modulate all the gameplay systems can be a bit loose. It needs some refinement in the future. Let's not forget that despite the recent surge of boomer shooters and indie games, very few of them still are committed to anything but basic story hooks and decent looking levels, but which invite very little exploration or examination. Immersion, let's say. Now like I said in my industrial video, I want more immersive first person games with fascinating worlds that we want to know more about, want to get lost in, that feel distinct and once in a lifetime. So when a game like Atomic Heart comes out that's trying so many big things at once, I can only offer my measured support and hope that Munfish learns from what is still a very impressive first effort for them and continues making games that push the envelope because these experiences are the ones that will ultimately warm my cold Atomic Heart the most. Thanks for watching. And a huge shout out to those of you generous enough to support my work by subscribing to my Patreon. I have to thank Mark Neubauer, Dead Forge, Hey Blondie, He Act Show, and M for their contributions. And a special thanks to The Nth Review and James Wyatt for subscribing to my Patreon's highest tier. If you'd like to be part of the reason this channel gets bigger and better, feel free to go over to patreon.com forward slash high functioning medium, or you can become a YouTube channel member, or if you prefer, you can donate to Kofi. Also check out my GOG and NordVPN affiliate links to contribute to the channel with no cost to you. God bless you everyone and I'll see you soon.